Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. Welcome to the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton and you're listening to episode 17, which is a special interview episode with the wonderful Lynette Barney. Hi there, beautiful teachers. Welcome back to the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. If this is your first time listening, you're going to want to go back and check out the first few episodes. We're at episode 17 already. I can hardly believe it. And so there's already 16 other episodes waiting for you on all sorts of topics related to music teaching and helping you teach better and run your business better. This is a special interview episode and it's with the wonderful Lynette Barney, as I mentioned in the intro. Lynette is a teacher in Arizona. And she has some really great insights into how we can structure our studios and engage our students, especially students who really are learning for fun, recreational students, as she calls them. How can we build our studio to make it more interactive between our students and make for more collaborative opportunities? And she's done just that in several different ways, which you're going to learn about in this interview. So let's dive in. Well, welcome everyone to this interview. I have the wonderful Lynette with me and I'm going to start with the colourful countdown. So Lynette is going to answer as many questions as she can in two minutes before the live viewers get here. So Lynette, tell me, are you a dog person, a cat person or neither? Um, I don't do cats because I'm allergic to them. Um, and dogs are fine, although, although I'm okay if I don't have one. My children have them, so they're around. Okay, but they're only fine. <laughs> <laughs> they're fine. Yeah. So speaking of pets, then, do you have any pet peeves? Anything that doesn't, shouldn't bother you, like a grammar thing or some nonsense, but it does get on your nerves? Oh, I, I'm probably a grammar Nazi, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do you have a, a particular grammar rule that when you see it, you're like, Ugh. it's the your, oh, the there, yours. there, there, your, and you know, yeah. those yeah. apostrophes or not. No <laughs> apostrophe, please. <laughs> Fantastic. And what was the first CD or album you ever owned? Do you remember? Oh, wow. <laughs> I don't really remember. I mean, I'm back from the age of, you know, we'd make our cassettes by recording yep. stuff off the radio Me so I had too. a lot of those I want to say the first album I bought was probably the soundtrack to Miss Saigon oh cool in high school well, that's a good one I love that musical awesome and last question then do you have any surprising hobbies either current or previous anything that might no I don't us? think my hobbies are surprising I just like to read <laughs> great <laughs> awesome just Anything I could get a hold of. If there's not a book in the back of the cereal box, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, well, let me kick off the interview officially. So welcome to this interview. This is part of the new series that I started a little while ago, for those of you who aren't familiar, where I'm talking with teachers who are doing awesome things inside the Vibrant Music Studio Teachers group here on Facebook. So I'm planning on doing one of these a month to share fantastic studios and things that are going on with various teachers. And my guest today runs a wonderful studio in Arizona, where the focus is on collaboration between students, ensemble work, and a cutting edge piano lab. I'm so excited to chat to you today, Lynette Barney. Welcome. Well, thank you. I'm excited to be here. Fantastic. So if you're watching uh, uh, live with us here, feel free to chime in with your questions. I'll try to refer to the chat and put them to Lynette as we go through if you have any follow up questions for the things we're chatting about. But Lynette, can you start off by just telling us a little bit about your studio, whereabouts you are, how long you've been teaching and how many students you have? Just the basics. OK, so I live in Tucson, Arizona, which is a city of about a million um, in the southwest United States. I've taught for about 27 years in Tucson, and right now my studio is about 65 students. Um, is that everything I was supposed to answer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How long have you been teaching? Just, about 27 years. 
Great. Wow. So what made you get into teaching? If you could think back 27 years ago, wh- where did it all start? Well, I definitely didn't plan on being a piano teacher. I was going to be an accountant. I was going to be a librarian. I was going to be all kinds of things. I was not going to be a piano teacher. But I taught on the side for a long time. And then just as it became important for me to support my family, I taught more. (laughs) And now that's what I do. I teach. Yeah, it sort of has a way of taking over for a lot of people, I think. (laughs) It does. And I still want to be a librarian when I grow up. Oh, really? (laughs) So I first heard of you and I first heard about um, what you were doing in your studio on an episode of Tim Topham's podcast, which was episode 35. We're coming up on episode 150 um, before the end of the year this year. So that was a while back. It was. Yeah. So you talked, it was called uh, Teaching Outside the Box, I think. And you talked about this innovative lesson format that you have with overlapping lessons. So can you tell us what you were doing then? It may have changed since then, but you can you talk us through that format and, and what made you start with that? Well, I have always loved collaboration in music. Um, the The solitary pianist role has never been my favorite. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've, I've done ballet accompanying, I've done choral accompanying, uh, instrumental voice, music theater. Um, and I just, I'm always happier as a musician if I'm making music with somebody else. So I'd rather sing with somebody else than sing a solo, play a duet than play a solo. And so I wanted to bring that into my studio because I think that piano is a pretty solitary, yeah. <laughs> a pretty solitary sport as far as music goes. And so, um, initially what I did was I created a structure where I had four students come overlapping. So they had time together. So the first two students would come and one would have their private lesson while the other one had their lab. Uh, the lab was mostly a filler because you had that space that mm-hmm. needed something in it. <clears throat> and then they would switch. So the other would have their private lesson and lap. And then the second pair of students would come. So we would have four in the studio at the same time. And we would do ensemble work and games and different activities. Then the first two would leave and the second two would do their lesson and lap. And I actually really love teaching that way. I did it for a couple of years and the kids were grouped by age and level. And then it all fell apart because it was too hard to group by age and level. So for a couple of years, I didn't teach that way. I taught private lessons and then like a monthly group class, which is more typical. Mm -hmm. Um, But my students whined and moaned and complained because they missed what we'd done before. So I decided the other issue with the way I'd done it was I I teach a lot of sibling groups and parents. Most of my families drive 20 20, 25, 30 minutes to get to my studio. I'm kind of centrally located, but I'm not really close to anybody that takes lessons from me. And so when you have four or five kids taking lessons, you don't want to drive four or five times to a different class for each student's level. And so what I did the second time around was I grouped the kids as much as I could by age and level, but that wasn't my top priority keeping siblings together was a bigger priority when that's what the parents wanted. So that gave us some really interesting experiences with little ones learning from big ones and big ones being teachers. Um, and I really enjoyed that. So that's, I did that, I think another three years and then I changed everything this year. Yeah. We'll get to the changes you made this year in a second, but how did you work the um, different levels? Because this is something like working with different levels together, because this is something that I do as well, partially inspired by hearing you. I lodged into something what I call buddy lessons, which is just two students overlapping generally, sometimes three if there's siblings involved and all of that, but mostly two students overlapping for a portion of their lesson and then having some time uh, one on one with me. But I made the decision for the same reason as you, that I would allow whatever mixture of um, ages and levels, like ideally aiming for the same age and the same level. And if not the same level, then the same age taking priority. But 
if there's siblings or if there's some situation like that, I'm just going to go with the flow. So how did you find it balancing the different levels and what kind of activities did you do to make that situation work? Um, let's see. Well, when we would do ensemble work, we did a lot of improvisation, mm -hmm. a lot of Forrest Kinney's materials. Yeah. I use those a lot because those can be so nicely leveled. Yeah. Um, you know, you can have a more advanced student doing a more difficult pattern and the more beginning student <clears throat> just doing the more beginning thing. Um, so I did a lot with that. I also did a lot with um, games where we could tweak them to be kind of multi-level or activities like that. I know I wrote a blog post for Tim. Yeah about some of those games like bingo is great if you have you know one set of cards can be keyboard geography yeah. <laughs> letters of and then one set of cards can be key signatures and one set of cards can be um naming notes on the staff mm -hmm. so everybody can be doing their own thing you just have to get creative and plan ahead yeah um another resource i love is the chopsticks infinity by Philip Johnston, mm -hmm. although it's driving some of my families crazy. <laughs> I've literally <laughs> but just picked that, that up, so I might be doing that to my family soon. <laughs> um, I'm really having to emphasize to the kids, quit playing chopsticks at home, okay? Your parents hate me. <laughs> just play the variation <laughs> to the home. studio. <laughs> but um, things yeah. like that work really well because the little tiny ones can play really, I mean, there's incredibly simple variations mm -hmm. in that book and there's incredibly difficult variations. So I just always have my eyes out for stuff like that. Um, Elisa Milne has in the back of her little peppers books, there's something called peas in a pod. Okay. And those can, they're multiple levels. There's five different levels and they can be played simultaneously. So those work really well. Um, we did a lot. We do a lot with lead sheets mm -hmm. because, again, you can have a single note base, a chord, yeah. inversions, patterns. Everybody learns the 12 bar blues because everybody can. Yeah. Um, so I just always would look for things like that mm -hmm. to do with with the kids. Fantastic. OK, so that was an awesome system. I feel like it worked really well for you. What you're, I hear you're switching things up again now, or you are this year. What's the transition you're making and why the change? Not teach as late in the evening. I was teaching until seven, seven thirty, eight, and I have a 14 year old and teaching in the afternoons actually worked great for a long time because we homeschooled our kids. But this particular daughter is, um, in public school right now. And so I never see my daughter because she's at school all day mm -hmm. and then I'm teaching all night. And by the time I get home at eight, eight thirty, we're both tired. Yeah. So I felt like it was a priority to squish my teaching schedule, my after hours schedule so that I would see my family more. I also have some adult kids living at home. And even though they are adults and their needs are a little different, they they, there's still a need for us to connect as a family in the evening. But I didn't want to lose any of my students. And I do support our family. Um, I am the sole provider in our family. So I, I, I couldn't just reduce my teaching time right. because that would reduce our income. So what I did, I'm still in the I don't know if I like it or not phase. <laughs> It's a lot of stress, um, and I'm trying to decide if this, these are growing pains or what I'm going to do long term. But what I did was I moved all my students into groups. Mm -hmm. So every one of my students, except for one five-year-old and two adults, are in groups. And the groups are more roughly age and level. Oh, I meant to say I never group teenagers with kids. In any setting, oh, right. regardless of their siblings. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'll put middle school and high school kids together, but I won't put like a 16 year old with a seven year old. That's just <laughs> too oh, far this, apart. Yeah. Um, but this year, everybody has an hour long musicianship class. 
and they're grouped roughly by age and level, although there's some interesting groupings. I have one set of siblings where I have two 11-year-old boys that have studied with me for about three years, and then there are two younger siblings that are just starting this year. Okay. So it's actually like two dyads yeah, <laughs> in the yeah. same group, but it works because the dyads are at the same level. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I squished them all into about 21 hours of groups. I think I teach four groups most days, two in the morning and three one afternoon. Anyway, it's about 21 hours. And then I just <clears throat> really didn't want to lose my existing students. And I wasn't confident that they were going to be okay going from a 90 minute lesson that includes lab ensemble and private to an hour long class that was all group instruction. Right. And so what I did was I, I included in my tuition video feedback during the week. So we use an app called Seesaw, which isn't a piano app. There are piano apps that kind of do the same thing, but mm-hmm. either they don't fit in my budget or they don't do what I want them to do. And Seesaw is okay. It works okay. Um, and the kids can send me photos, videos, notes, files. And so we kind of have an ongoing communication stream throughout the week. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I budgeted enough. <laughs> I I didn't think people... I didn't think people would take as much advantage of it as they have, but that's partly my own fault because I also discovered that the way I'm teaching now really exposes kids that don't practice in a way that didn't happen when it was private lessons. Mm -hmm. They could hide in a private lesson that they were unprepared more than they can now. So I've been really pushing better practice habits, which wasn't the direction I intended to go. So it's been kind of stressful. (laughs) (laughs) Like it it took an unexpected turn, but so that's what I'm doing now. They have their hour musicianship class. And then um, in that musicianship class, we do ensemble work. We do chopsticks. That's really fun because it's our transition activity from group to group. Mm -hmm. So as one group is leaving, another group is coming and they chopstick together. So there's so like, like seven or eight kids. Yeah, wow. I it's could. fun. <laughs> and we do whatever we're studying right now. We're studying blues. Um, we're actually using your spooky sounds for composition right, yeah. and improvisation. Um, what else are we doing? Each of the classes has a, a duet or a trio or quartet. Mm-hmm. My favorite one is I have a group doing the Bumble Boogie Quartet. That's super that. fun. Where's that from? It's a uh, I think it's Jack Fina, F-I-N-A. Okay. The, it's the Bumble Boogie is an orchestral piece that Disney used in an old movie years ago. It's got this B and all these piano keys and flowers and okay. anyway, you can find it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But so everybody has an ensemble they're doing. And then I also take some time to check in with each student, but there's not enough time. So they've got to check in with me during the week from home. Right. And that's where the video feedback comes in. Um, but it, it, I felt really good about making the change, but it has been way more stressful than I anticipated. I think I'm working more than I was before. So I'm not sure if that's what I meant to do. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you achieved the objective yet. Maybe you'll get there. Um, so tell me in the ans- in the group class, you call the musicianship classes, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So in the musicianship class, they're doing some duets and trios and stuff together. What are they mm-hmm. doing when they're not working all together? Like if you're talking to one of them, what are the others doing? Um, usually what I have is like a mini lab kind of thing going on. Mm-hmm. So, for example, I might we've been reviewing key signatures So the younger kids are working on their guide notes and the older kids are working on key signatures. Mm -hmm. So I might send them off to do note quest or note rush or um, music flash class to do the key signature review or to draw the key signatures on the whiteboard. Um, And we also have a warm up station. So kind of when we go into the individual time, I'll have 
one on the iPad, one on the whiteboard, one on the Clavinova with headphones, and one at the Grand with me. Sometimes we'll go in the in my lab where I have four digital keyboards, and I'll have them all there with headphones, and I'll just check in with them mm-hmm. one at a time. So it just depends. Sometimes it's guided practice. You know, I'll say I want you to do this five times, and then I have these cones I found at the dollar store that are red and green. So they put their green cone up when they're ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I kind of drew some ideas from what a couple of colleagues are doing. Like Daniel Patterson, I know, does group stuff, and he does it very differently than I do, but I pulled some ideas from what he does. Mm -hmm. Um, Mostly, though, we're playing together, which I think is why the at-home practicing has become such an issue, because they're not practicing at the lesson. (laughs) Yeah, I like, can't get away with that um, because mostly we're playing and the ensembles don't go very well if they don't know their part. Yeah. So and if they're in a solo lesson and they haven't practiced, like, yeah, you might talk to them about it, but it's not going to be as as crushingly apparent <laughs> that they're not making as good a progress as they could be, you know, if someone right. else is actually practicing. <laughs> right. 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 So, um, yeah, so that's what we do when they're working individually. Mm -hmm. And then we'll just rotate really quickly. You know, it's like five minutes. Yeah. At each little station. Yeah. So it might be like 20 minutes out of the hours is is that kind of work. And then most of it is all together. Right. Yeah. Um, So. You mentioned one group where there's two 11-year-olds and two younger siblings who are just beginners. Are most of them, though, more evenly leveled? Yes, for the most part. Um, More or less. More or less, right. (laughs) I mean, when when I did my registration, I asked parents specifically, is it more important to you to have your kids with siblings or with kids of their level? And I had a handful of families where carpooling or siblings together was the request. Yeah. But most of my families were willing to make two trips or have a better experience. Yeah. Yeah. Because they realized that it would be a, a better experience for the kids or that it wasn't. I mean, I have one girl who's, I think, 10 and her sister's 16 So putting them together wasn't even an option. I told the mom, she said, I want them together. And I said, I'm sorry, but (laughs) I can't, I can't make that work. That wouldn't be fair to the girls or the groups. Yeah. But I, but it really just depends on the family. I have one family that's a high school. So he's 11th grade and then a ninth grader and then a sixth grader. Um, but the sixth grader is super mature for her age yeah. and they overlap. It's like they're their own class. And then there's another class that I didn't want to have five. So it's three and two. And I keep hoping for someone to come along and join us. Okay. And the other two are a seventh grader and a 10th grader. And level wise, they're all close enough okay. that it works. And for that group, we're actually using, I don't know if I have them around. Um, it's five, five, five songs for five right hands at one piano. Have you ever seen those? That sounds familiar, but I definitely don't, I haven't seen it in person. Yeah. And then there's like five, four songs for five left hands at one piano. Anyway, they're about, they're like a early intermediate. I don't know how that relates to exam levels, but yeah. if you relate it to like, um, the Alfred, the publisher levels, it's an early intermediate, intermediate level. And we're doing those with that group and they're like sight reading for most of the kids, but they're rhythmically tricky. Yeah. And, so and for it's that harder group, when you're playing works. together. Yeah. Um, so it's fun. So each group kind of has its own vibe <laughs> and its own mm-hmm. makeup. But most of them are pretty close in level and age. Pretty close enough. And do you still have them in, like, as well as ensemble pieces <laughs> and stuff, do you still have them in, like, standard method books? Or have you just put them to a side? No, I do. I have them in method books. I use method books primarily for sight reading. Okay. Um. So I tend to teach 
other stuff until they're ready to read. And then when they're ready, when they're reading, I want them to be going through the material quickly. I don't want their method books to be challenge. their challenging material. Right. So we start with Piano Safari. That's mm-hmm. my go-to for my beginners. And then once they're reading pretty comfortably, like they know their guide notes, they can read intervolically, then we do music tree. Okay. And with the video feedback, some of the students will send me a piece a day. Mm. <laughs> because they're that easy. I mean, they Yeah, can... yeah, yeah. Um and so then they kind of fly through the music tree books and we keep going with piano safari and sometimes I'll throw celebrate piano in for the multi-key reading. Mm-hmm. Those are the primary methods that I use. Okay, great. But they're primarily for the reading experience. And then I use uh, Samantha Coates Blitz yeah. repertoire. Oh, my goodness. I love that. <laughs> I do a lot with that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I've added that this year, and the kids love it. Um, so they're doing and, – and, of course, the Piano Safari wrote stuff. Yeah. But it sounds like – the way you approach reading and stuff really feeds into this really well because they can do most of that independently, right? Because you're so far ahead of it with their theory knowledge. Right. Like, I don't want them reading until they're reading. Yeah. (laughs) Because if they're going home and struggling over what note to play, right? then then there's not a point. The, The point to me of them reading at home is once they're comfortable reading at home. So um, and that's not fun when you do it in the lesson either. So, <laughs> you know, you could spend a whole half hour reading one tiny piece if you if you're going if you're pushing that hard with all of their repertoire, you know. Right. Yeah. Right. And I also I have this herd of 6-year-olds this year which <laughs> I I I haven't had a lot of 6-year-olds recently and okay. this year I have 7 of them. Okay. So, But they're in two classes. They're divided into a group of four and a group of three. But it's my herd of six-year-olds. And I think we're going to do the Music Tree Primer. Um, I haven't used that for a while because for most of the kids, it's kind of more than they need. Right. Uh, But this year, I'm I'm looking at this this little group of six-year-olds and thinking, "Uh, (laughs) (laughs) they need more readiness. Like their parents want them to have something to read. Right. But I feel like technique wise, if we move too fast in the piano safari reading material, I'm gonna lo- they're going to lose their technique because they're focusing on the reading. Mm-hmm. So we're going to do the music tree time to begin, you know, where they're just doing two fingers. <laughs> yeah. Lots of two fingers, but the parents will feel like they're reading. Yes, so it feels like an accomplishment. Yeah. Right. They want their kids reading and passing off pages. And I found the rote material doesn't feel like that to the parents. I have to do a lot of parent education. Yeah, it's so it's so strange, isn't it? Because the rote material actually if they just, you know, put put aside their strange expectations or whatever they have in their head <laughs> and um just put that out of their head and just sat there with their eyes closed and listen to their kid read a piece and then listen to them play a rope piece at, at a six-year-old beginner level. They go, right. oh my God, that kid can pay, play. <laughs> and they listen to the reading piece, they'd be like, oh, okay. You know? Yay. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't sound exciting. I had a comment there yeah. from Adriana who says, talk more about the younger students. So I'll ask some follow-up <laughs> questions for you there. Um, so you have all these six-year-olds. They just started. Is that right? They're all yes, brand new Yes, it's a beginners. herd of, of beginners. Your some of herd. them did um, my summer camp. Okay. And some of them didn't. Mm-hmm. But I'm finding that hasn't made that big of a difference, although I won't necessarily advertise that mm-hmm. fact. <laughs> 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 but, but I mean, with the kids, it's, it's just like with the kids that were ready, they're just flying. Yeah. And, and the kids that well, they're ready, but they're ready in a different way. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> but do you find the biggest disparity is the understanding or the like motor control or what is it that's the most different between the ones who feel very ready and the ones who are not flying so much? 
Um, I think a large part of it has to do with, of course, at home involvement. Right. When I'm able to get the parents on board and the kids are actually practicing, it goes a lot better. Um, the one little girl that's just flying, I have to get this girl reading so I can move her to a different group <laughs> because yeah. everything I give her, she does. And then she does it. Okay. It's right hand. Now I've done it right hand, left hand, hands together. What do you want me to do now? Should I transpose it? Like she's, <laughs> she's that kind of a kid. Um, so she's playing circles around all the other kids in the group. <laughs> right. And that's one of the biggest um, challenges of groups though, isn't it? Cause you know, right. I don't want to be holding her back. You don't want the others to feel bad. Right. Exactly. But I can't move her yet because if I move her and she's not reading, yeah. then she'll struggle in the other groups where the kids are reading. So we just, she's, she's really cute. She has an adorable personality and mm-hmm. she's just incredibly self-motivated. So I just give her more stuff to do at home. I try to find parallel mm-hmm. material that I can, I'm going to actually have her do coming out of spring break, I'm going to give her the little gems, Paula Dreyer's little gems, because I'm not using that yet for the other kids. Okay. And it'll give her something she can do. And her mom plays and her older siblings play, which I actually think makes a big difference. Mm. There's actually battles at their house for piano time, which is fun. (laughs) The battle isn't about getting her to practice. It's getting her off the piano yeah. so somebody else I love it can when that practice. happens. Yeah. So we're going to do little gems for her because she can learn those more on her own. And, and, but they're, you know, solid technique. So I don't have to worry. And she's got great technique. So I don't have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the ones that are struggling the most are the ones that are just aren't practicing. And again, it's that issue of they're not practicing. So we all sit down to play our Charlie Chipmunk and everybody can play Charlie Chipmunk except so-and-so, you know, Jose's over there. Can't remember Charlie Chipmunk because he didn't watch the reminder video and he didn't play it during the week and he can't remember it from last week. Um, So that's a source of stress for me. How to, what do I do in those cases? How do I want to handle that? Because yeah. like you said, in the past, in the private lesson, we just worked on Charlie Chipmunk. Yeah. <laughs> you just went really slowly. So are the, the you're getting uh, videos through Seesaw during the week. Mm-hmm. And then some of them, like Jose, I don't know if that's a real student or not, but anyway. No, it's not. There's no Jose. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll take Jose as a, as a pretend example. He's just not sending, his parents are not sending a video of him playing Charlie Chipmunk and the all, others all have. Right. Yeah. So you know before he even gets there that not happening. Right. That it's probably, <laughs> so there's lots of parent education going mm-hmm. on. And I'm finding that with the six-year-old crew, a lot of the parents are getting on board because they're here. The Jose's parents, oh. I need to get to class. Because then Jose's parent would see that Jose is struggling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't have to have that conversation. So most of the parents of the your youngest students are in the room or just in the... Yes. Right. Yeah, actually, I think I have one group where of three where no parents stay. And one group and the group of four, all the parents stay, which actually that's had some interesting side effects too, because I got a text from a parent telling me I didn't spend enough time with her child that I was favoring other children. And this child was always going last and got not getting enough turns. And I was like, Oh, bother. (laughs) So the next class I tried really hard. (laughs) And I, at the end of the class, I thought, if I were the other kids' parents, I'd be saying, my kid didn't get enough turns. <laughs> oh, because this particular student actually is struggling. It's the student of the four that's struggling the most right. in class to pick things up. Now, the student is working hard at home. But in class, the other kids are picking it up quite a bit faster than this student. We were doing I Like Bananas. Yeah, And they had been listening to it and singing it and watching it all week for two weeks. And two, three, three of the kids had figured it out on their own. 
they just right. picked it out. And this young man had done all his assignments. He could sing it. He had watched it. We went to go play it and getting it between the two hands. He couldn't do it. Yeah. He was trying to do it with one finger and all the other kids were doing it with two. And I was glad the parent was there. I hope that they saw that he's struggling. Like, yeah. And it's okay. He'll get it. Yeah. But don't tell me he's not getting it because I'm not spending time with him because <laughs> that's not the reason. I am. Yeah. Um, so that's been an interesting dynamic of I want the parents here so they can help the kids at home, but I'm feeling a little more like a bug under a microscope than I ever have. <laughs> yeah. And do you encourage the parents to get involved? Or are they very much in the in the corner watching? They They're ever, in the corner there? watching, and I have thought about maybe pulling them out of the corner. Right. Because I have one group um, where I, I – there's a couple parents I need to just get into the studio. And this this particular group, it's not it's not um, my six-year-old beginners. It's – I think the kids are nine-ish, nine and ten-ish, and they're um, – a range of levels, but they're all in piano safari level one. So they're all okay. roughly in that, they're in that book. Yeah. Um, and there's one parent who comes and in fact, she's like the cutest little assistant teacher. <laughs> she's over there, like turning pages for kids that are lost. And, <laughs> and I'm thinking, I like this. This is nice. How can I get the parents? Because her student is doing really well this year. Right. I think he's really benefiting from the social element. Um, and his mom, I don't know, there some things clicked this year. And he's just flying. And it's really fun having her around. And there's two kids in that class that are struggling. And I'm thinking, well, if I could just get their moms to come, I think yeah. they'd do better. That's so interesting, so, isn't it? Yeah. I suppose. Do you think any of it is them being in the lesson and the kids behaving differently because of it? Or do you think it's just they're helping at home more because they see what's going on? I think when they're here, they know better what's going on. So they're mm -hmm. better able to help. Yeah. And for the most part, I don't have problem parents. Like, I mean, there's that one where I'm thinking, uh, you're making me nervous because you're telling me I'm not working with your child. Um, yeah. But for the most part, I think my parents are, are really great parents. Mm -hmm. And so having them in the studio, sometimes I have to train them for what I expect a bit. But I, I haven't had a whole lot of issues with kids acting differently when their parents were here versus when they weren't. Hmm. I, yeah. I hear teachers talk about that, and it isn't something I've dealt with a whole lot. Yeah, and my parents are here a lot, and mm -hmm. for the most part, my par my parents are here more than they're not, especially when the kids are younger. Oh, and that's always been true, despite like before <laughs> you did the groups and everything. Okay, yeah. that's interesting. I, I I've always find... encouraged them to be in the lesson. Yeah, yeah, I've only found a difference one-on-one -on -one. like if it's a group the kids pretty much act how they're gonna act but if, <laughs> if like they just are themselves but if it's one-on-one -on -one with some kids I do find it makes an enormous difference if their parent is in the room either positively or negatively like I've right. both ways where they behave so much better and they concentrate better when their mom's there and they want to show them you know and I've had where they just completely act the maggot, like they just completely act up when mom is there and then they leave the room and they're just an angel again. It's just, you know, mm -hmm. showing off a bit. So it's good. To or the occasional that parent that like teaches from the side or, yeah, you know, that kind of thing. I haven't dealt with that a lot, but I know no. I've, I've seen it. Um, I've had very... Very short experiences with that, but I think I shut it down pretty, pretty quickly with a good <laughs> glare, you know, just <laughs> make it very clear that no, that's not your job. Stay over there. <laughs> um, like it's grand for them to be involved, but you know, there's a boundary there. Well, and I really love it when the parents 
are willing, either they play, so they're willing to do the teacher yeah. parts with the child or to do improvisation, or they're willing to try. You know, maybe they don't play, but you can teach them a really simple improvisation and they can do it with their child. Yeah. I find when I can get the parents doing that, the kids are all over that. Yeah, it's fantastic. So. Yeah. And I love it as well. Um, a couple of situations where I've had an adult beginner, like a mum, come on as a beginner and then they like mm -hmm. as an actual student and they get to experience these things together and go through all the struggles together. And it can be really wonderful. I thought it would be neat to offer like a mom and child class. Yeah. Like, um, you know, like the six year old beginner and the mom beginner. Yeah. I think that could be kind of fun. You'd have to have the right dynamics and grouping. And a lot of my families um, have a lot of kids. Right. Yeah. So yeah. there's very uh, many of my families are juggling. Do I come into the lesson? But then I have to bring my three year old in. And they're a holy terror. So maybe not. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but um, it's, it's that's something I thought would be a really neat experience. Yeah. Yeah, it's something to try. I just have uh, one piano mum and her kid and th their lessons. She, the kid stays for her mum's lesson and does all mm -hmm. this theory work. She's, she loves theory workbooks. <laughs> Absolutely adores them. Like I offer her piano maestro and she's like, no, I'll just do my theory <laughs> workbook. Like, I'll okay. just do a few more workbook pages. I'll just keep, keep going up way beyond my playing level in my theory. I, anyway. <laughs> But it's lovely, the dynamic between them, and I've got them playing duets and stuff, and uh, yeah, it's great. Um, but this has been absolutely fascinating. I just want to make sure to get to this seesaw area, because this seems to be the area <laughs> that has maybe um, been more of a challenge than you've been expecting. And I'd love to know more about how it actually works. Like, what expectations have you set? Have you told them to record all their practice? Oh, no, please, no. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> what boundaries have you set there and what, what are they told to do? Um, what I've asked them to do is it's kind of evolved because uh, the learning curve was a challenge, especially communicating assignments. Mm -hmm. um, going from in the private lesson, yeah. I would type up their individual assignments. Well, there's no time for that no. in the class. And the other thing is because my hope is that they're passing off material during the week, especially reading material mm -hmm. or maybe moving up a metronome level in their technique or whatever, that the assignments need to be more plastic. They can't just be set for a week and then changed at the lesson. And I think I lost quite a bit of hair trying to figure out how to communicate that and how to use the resource in a way that was effective. So what I do now is they actually have a folder in Seesaw called All My Assignments. And there's a note, a little, it looks like a notepad mm -hmm. note that has typed instructions for each thing they're supposed to do. So it might say Music Tree, page seven, keep your eyes on the music, send me a video when it's ready, be sure to count out loud or whatever the instruction yeah, yeah. is. And each student has between five and 10 notes, depending on what kind of practicer they are and learner they are. And they can comment on a note. So they're supposed to comment each time they practice that note. They're supposed to put the date in the box. Okay. Some of them do it. Some of them are will do it. They just don't do it yet. Yeah. <laughs> and and that works really well because I can see unless they're lying to me, which some do. I can see what they've practiced and they can see what they've practiced. Mm -hmm. You know, they can see, oh, I didn't do my Zachariah zebra mm -hmm. yesterday. So I better be sure to do it today. And as soon as they pass something off by video, I can update the notes and retire the old note and make a new note. Um, and their parents can see. So that's evolved into something that's working. Okay. Um, except for the Samsung phones can't get to that folder. So every couple of days I have to go move all their notes up and, and Seesaw's working on that. Okay. <laughs> it's actually an engineering problem. Um, 
So that, so for their assignments, they're supposed to log in and just go down their assignment notes one at a time and do each one. Yeah. And then they're supposed to send me one or maybe two videos a day because I don't have time to listen to more than that. Yeah. So it might be something they're ready to pass off or something where they want me to check the fingering or a question or if it's one of their performance pieces, maybe the new line that they've learned hands together now yeah. and they're playing it for me. So most of the videos are just about 30 seconds long, 30 seconds to a minute. Mm -hmm. Uh, they might show me that they can go through their flashcards. Um, they might play a technical exercise. Um, so it's, I, it was getting a little out of hand. So I had to tell them one or two videos a day instead of some kids would wait until the day before their lesson and then send me a video of everything. And that wasn't the intent. (laughs) <laughs> and then I would never know how many videos I would have a day. Yeah, yeah. And some days it was a lot. So um, they also send photos of their theory pages and I just check them real okay. quick. Yeah. So you mentioned at the start that you hadn't anticipated how many people would take advantage of this system and how much it would be used. So how long do you think you're spending each day watching these videos and are you commenting back are you ever recording videos back yes I do all of that so I might update an assignment note I might send an instructional video back I always comment on their videos and I try to do it you know the sandwich way where I say something good something they can improve something else I'm very mindful actually of what I'm saying because once you hit a record button on something right? It just goes like, oh, <laughs> it's so much more serious. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, it's going to be read by the student, by their parents, mm-hmm. by me again. I mean, it's not that I'm mean or anything with my students, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I am finding I am more mindful Yeah, about always being sure to point out what they're doing well, um, even if it's very little. <laughs> You know, even if it's a disaster and they forgot all the key signatures that they're reading the treble clef and the bass clef, I'll still say they had good hand position. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I've, it's been cool to be more mindful of that, I think, than when I speak. Maybe I'm not as mindful. Um, so I always comment back and I expect them to comment back to me, too. OK, so that I know they saw it. Because it's not a conversation if they never look at what I said. Yeah. And that's taking and some training. Some of the kids, nine-year-old girls are the best. They just think it's way fun. <laughs> <laughs> and they send me notes about what they're going to be for Halloween. And they ask lots of questions. And they love it when I can tag multiple students. So, for example, for their duets or ensembles, mm-hmm. I have these three nine-year-old girls. And their assignment note, they're all tagged in. So they can see when each other practices it. And they'll get on each other. Like, you didn't practice that for three days, Heidi. (laughs) And Heidi's over there like, yeah, we were at the beach. (laughs) Give me a break. Um, So there's some even some little bits of Mm -hmm. camaraderie through Seesaw. And I want to build on that more. But right now, we just need to get it down get the system going before you get, get fancy with it. Going. Yeah. But I do track the time I spend because because that's how I operate. Yeah. And it tends to be about an hour and a half a day. Okay. So, so and I'm that's less that's lesson planning, responding. It's not just watching the videos. Cuz yeah, I'll also exactly. make notes of oh, I need to make sure we cover this in class or so it's about an hour and a half a day and I do it usually six days. I don't, I refuse to work on Sunday. Yeah. So, but I will often watch videos on Saturday before my kids get up just so that I don't have as much to do on Monday. Yeah, just to get ahead. <laughs> yeah. But I like it. The kids like the forum. They like the format. Mm-hmm. Um, they like, I've had to kind of be a meanie and tell them not to send me long videos of them levitating objects and putting on plays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, just don't have time. I'm sorry. Um, but they, oh, they can also do drawings. 
Oh, that's cool. And they, they enjoy that. Okay. So, um, I can upload a JPEG and they can actually draw on the JPEG so they can do theory assignments that way too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, are most of your students then, like, apart from your cohort of six year olds, I'm assuming, are most of them interacting with the app themselves or are their parents? Sitting there with um, them when they do their for practice. For the most part, they're doing it themselves. Right. But for the most part. On the older side, like nine and above kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think, <clears throat> I think they, yeah, they're seven, eight and up. Mm-hmm. I have a lot, all these six year olds. And then I'm trying to think how many seven, sevens and eights I have. There's some. Yeah. But they're, they're getting it. They tend to be less typey. They can make a voice comment okay. and that's what they tend to do because it's easier than typing. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think most of them are pretty independent. Mm. A lot of times they'll, like the teenagers will just take their phone and prop it at the end of the piano so that okay. they don't even need help making the videos. Because they're not performance quality. That's not what we're looking no, for. No, no, no. But sometimes I will say, have somebody hold the camera because I want to watch for this and I can't see it from <laughs> looking yeah. sideways across the keyboard. Um, but they are pretty independent and I'm encouraging them to be. I, I have a couple of parents where I'm trying to train the kids and the parents to let the kids do more of it. Because mm-hmm. parents are doing more of it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And then did you find any of the tech setup was a problem or was it all okay? Seesaw is available on various different platforms. So it was sort of okay for anyone to use any device and all that stuff. That part's gone pretty well, mm-hmm. <clears throat> except for the Samsung phone yeah. problem. Uh, the other than that, it's been pretty painless once we figured out how we were doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, the kids do have to log in with an email. And okay. one mistake I made was I didn't realize that if I want my parents to have a family account, they can't use their parent email as the child's oh. login. So we have a number where we're having to take those emails off and, you know, use a different email yeah. for the child. And, you know, not all six-year-olds have an email. Yes. <laughs> So then it's, you know, do you use dad's email and then mom's for the family account? Right. Um, so that, that, that piece of it was a little tricky. Also, I found that when you do the email login, the kids can log in through email or they can log in specifically through Google. And we discovered don't use the Google login that. Okay. I have a lot of blocks on my iPads. Um, just to keep them safe right? so that I can yeah, yeah, yeah. hand them to the student and trust that everything's okay. And um, logging in through Google created problems. <laughs> YouTube and things. Yeah. Yeah. And so we had to make sure that they logged in through email. So now it's a lot smoother when a new student starts because I know what to tell them to do. Yeah. There's a bit of a learning curve to oh, sort all that out. There's going to be things like that. So it sounds more like growing pains than like actual pains then. As you get these things up and running, you know, it sounds like you're finding your groove and finding your system. Um, I'm very conscious of how long I've kept you, but you're so fascinating, this whole system and all of this, uh, these transitions. I have one final question for you, and that's because you've made several changes in your studio. You know, you moved to the overlapping lessons and back away from the overlapping lessons, then back to the overlapping lessons and now to groups. Can you tell us for anyone who's looking to make a change like this, they're make, they're teaching standard 30 minute lessons or something like that, and they want to change something. Maybe they want to go to partners, maybe groups, maybe buddy lessons, something like that. Do you have any words of wisdom for how you handled this with parents and the transition period and how it went in your studio? I just am a big believer in having a positive mindset. Okay. So when I decided this summer, this is what I needed to do, I had had the idea and I felt really positive about it. 
I talked to my sister about it. I wrote down all the benefits on a piece of paper. And then I spent two weeks talking myself out of it. Okay. Like they're not going to want it. Everybody's yeah. going to quit. It's not going to work. Um, I need to, I need to keep doing what I'm doing and introduce this new idea, but not make it mandatory for everyone. Right. Well, that doesn't work that doesn't, when you're trying yeah. to transition 50 students or 60 students. And so one day I came across that piece of paper I had written. I love scratch paper and I write and I write and then I throw it away. Mm -hmm. And that's how I think. And I came across this paper and I started reading it and I remembered how I felt when I came up with the idea. And I was like, okay, I'll just do it. I felt good about it. I don't feel good about anything else. And so all the time that I was prepping, when I was writing the emails, when I was doing my tuition structure, when I was communicating with the parents, I kept this vision in my mind of all these happy students yeah. who were enjoying their lessons, who were having a good time playing with their friends, who were developing awesome ensemble skills. And as long as I can, and, and, and the reasons I was doing it, yeah. going home and having dinner with my family, um, doing the video feedback during the day when my kids were at school so that I was more available when they were home. A side note is the irony is I think I'll probably be homeschooling my 14 year old again soon, but never mind that. (laughs) Thanks dear. Um, But as long as I kept that in my mind, then I wasn't afraid. But when I started to let doubt creep in, Mm -hmm. like a parent would say, well, I don't know if this is going to work for us. If I let those doubts creep in, then I lost, uh, then I, lo- I would just have to bring back that positive intent. And, and I've had to keep doing that all semester <laughs> as I've been frustrated with the way some things have gone. Mm-hmm. I have to go back to that, that really I had an idea and I believed in my idea and I saw the benefits in it. And yeah. just holding on to that, that's what made the difference for me, which has nothing to do with teaching at all. <laughs> but um, no, but wait, if I can believe in it, I can sell it to my family. Yes. If I don't believe in it, they're not going to buy it. Yes. And if you believe so, in it, not just as a way for you to see your daughter, but as an actual vision of how it looks for, you know, for your studio and your students, which you did, that comes right. across in the way you communicate it. For sure. And, and interestingly enough, I, I didn't lose anybody I didn't already yeah, expect doesn't, to lose. doesn't sound like you did with 60-odd 60, 60 students. And I, and I gained a lot of new students. I had a lot of siblings start, my mm-hmm. herd of six-year-olds, um, new families to my studio. The ones I lost, I wasn't surprised because I'd already seen it coming. Um, right now where I'm at with it is, is this really how I want to teach? Right. Now that I'm in the middle of it and doing it, um, there's some challenges like how do I integrate a new student in? How do I get them started because they don't know what a hamburger is? (laughs) That's uh, the Charlene Shelt flashy fingers. Right. uh, I'm sure they do know what an actual hamburger is. (laughs) Right. They don't know what a hamburger is. They don't know what their guide notes are. They don't know how to improvise. They don't know what our technique um, towers are, the way that I introduce different technique skills. Um, And it's not fair to the existing class to have to stop all the cool things they're doing to go back and review what a hamburger is. Yeah. So I'm realizing I need to have like a transition class. Yeah. Or a catch up camp or kids. something. Yeah. Something. So there's some, some hurdles I haven't quite figured out how to face. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think ideally, honestly, if I, what, if I didn't have to support my family, I probably would go back and teach the way I taught before the private with the group where they have all three elements. Um, I, I think I prefer that, but financially the reality is 
unless I charge more than people would even fathom paying, I, it, that doesn't work. Right. I need to do the group tuition structure for those financial reasons. And I'm a perfectionist in my teaching. So I have to make it, I have to make it just as effective as yeah. the other way would be. That's super important to me. I don't want to shortchange my students. Yes. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, it it makes perfect sense. But it sounds like you are striving for that. And you're not far in, so don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> like, how long ago did you start this process? It was in August. We started so like, mid-August. Give yourself a chance. I think but it I sounds thought, like you're doing Oh, I've great. taught groups for years. This will right. be easy. It's not easy. It's diff- It's a different story when you've no solo time and you've, yeah, all these different challenges. But keeps things it interesting, right? It does. It keeps me on my toes. Yeah, and it's, for sure. It's good. It's. I'm glad I'm doing it. I'm glad I'm playing around with it. So, awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your journey and being so honest about the challenges <laughs> along the way and and everything, and how you're handling everything. Um, if people have follow up questions, is the best thing just if they tag you here in the group, or is there somewhere you want people to reach out to you? Anything like that? Probably just in the group. They can would just be tag. most effective. Perfect. So people can just tag you in the comments here. And um, yes, just thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Lynette. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I hope it inspires some people to give some interesting new lesson formats a go. Well, thank you. It's always fun to talk about what we do as teachers, isn't it? Yes. Fantastic <laughs> to talk shop. And I hope you'll be at NCKP. I, I hope you will. <laughs> so I hope we'll meet there. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Lynette. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Wasn't that interview just fantastic? I'm so grateful to Lynette for sharing her time with us on that Facebook Live interview and for allowing me to reshare it here on the podcast because I think it's so valuable and full of such great, interesting ideas and honesty. She was so forthright with us with what was going well and what she wasn't quite so sure about yet, but she was still experimenting on. So thank you so much again to Lynette for sharing that with us. And thanks to all of you for listening. I really hope you enjoyed this interview. If you're thinking about trying group lessons or overlapping lessons, then you're going to need some extra activities that work in that situation. And the Vibrant Music Teaching Library is full of them. So if you're not already a member, become a member today and create engaging learning opportunities for your students. Go to vmt.ninja to learn more today.